All right, so the first thing we really want to emphasize, and as you look through your booklet, you'll notice we really start out and we end with a discussion of all of the versatility of the German Shepherd dog. You can read about the, uh, a really nice, concise history in here of how it you know, evolved into a tending uh, perimeter type of herding dog and what was expected of it. And then from there, it became more of a working dog with many different tasks it was required to do or relied upon to do. And today, if you think about it, you know, I understand they've got uh, some German Shepherds trained to uh, detect lanternfly eggs. Have you all heard of lanternflies? Well, they're a big problem, and I guess, where is it, mostly back east, but in certain areas of the country, they're an invasive species of insect, and they devastate the uh, ecology in certain ways. So, you know, uh, also, I understand that uh, some German shepherds have been trained to detect COVID-19 to a, a degree of accuracy of like 98 or 99 percent. Isn't that a lot more effective and rapid uh, than a test, which a lot of times we can't even figure out where to go to get a test. So there really isn't anything that the German Shepherd dog can't do. Other breeds are designed or developed or bred to be really expert at particular uh, types of activities, be it retrieving or pointing or pulling sleds or things like that. But all of those things can be done by the German Shepherd dog. My first dog I used to take hunting. He would retrieve ducks for me from the water. He would uh, chase out, you know, flush out birds and rabbits, things. There was nothing he couldn't do. Maybe he couldn't do each one of them better than the specific breed that was designed or developed to do those things, but he could do a, a larger variety of things than any other breed. So we feel like we have a wonderful, unique breed. We want to preserve those characteristics of the breed. So we need to understand what the standard is telling us and what's the state of the breed today. So starting with the first Go ahead. The first slide gives us the general terminology of the anatomy. Does anybody have any questions about this? All right, we're going to be talking about this in more detail, but particularly we're going to be addressing length of loin. We're going to be talking about depth of body, placement of shoulder assembly, and as well as the structure or the appearance of the head, and really the, the entire anatomy. But those are some of the key things. Croups. I know we're going to talk a little bit more about croups. So the underneath in your book, this picture is the next one, that one there. And that's a pretty good that's a uh, pretty good illustration of all the things we're going to be talking about when we think about the structure underneath the surface. For instance, uh, when we talk about depth of body, we can see that the ribbing comes to here and the sternum should come to the elbow, but underneath that you have muscle and flesh or skin and then hair. So that's going to be something we need to take into consideration when we're evaluating the depth of body of a dog. It may not be as deep as it appears. One of the ways you determine that would be to reach underneath the dog and actually put your hand there. I, I just think another statement's really important, and that is when you're judging the German Shepherd dog, you don't really need to be giving them a body massage. Uh, there is very few parts of the animal you actually really have to touch. Obviously, when you're examining teeth, you might be touching the head. If you're checking the depth of the body, you would reach underneath, checking testicles on males, of course, and uh, the tail, see if the tail is limp or if the dog is tucking its tail because it's got an issue, okay? So, but other than that, 
We really don't need to be massaging the dogs. You might want to place a hand on the shoulder just to see, you know, make sure you know where, where uh, you know, kind of the angle or whatever, but that's about it. We then judge them more on motion because that's really what counts. But the motion should be a function of the structure. Okay, I think that the opening section or paragraph of the standard is one of the most important, and if we don't keep it foremost in mind, we lose sight of the fact of what the German Shepherd dog should embody physically, and we get a one-dimensional animal. You know, if many of the dogs that we have today are superior at gating in circles, right? But if dog shows were canceled tomorrow, would these dogs have a job? All right, so that's what we need to ask ourselves. What kind of animal are they? What kind of a fit animal are they? And you can see that it starts out with the first impression is a strong, agile, well-muscled animal, alert and full of life. So that should be our initial impression when you're looking at the dogs when they first come in the ring. You know, who looks fit, well-muscled and agile? I think today we're seeing a lot of refinement. We're seeing too much narrowness of body and lack of bone. All right, and so those are some things that I think we want to be really careful about rewarding when we're judging. We should be looking, remembering that the opening of the standard talks about a fit, well-muscled animal. And then it's balance. Balance is another very, very important aspect of a correct dog. Uh, we don't want, we don't need extreme at either end to the, to the detriment of having balance, all right? A balanced dog can work, can work, have better endurance, so be thinking about that when you're looking at, at these dogs. I would like to make a couple of comments about that too. The, the general appearance, I agree with Bob, a lot of the dogs are becoming a little too wispy and narrow, um, but the general appearance of the dog should be of a dog that can be agile and nimble, okay? These are working dogs. They're supposed to be working dogs. They should have a structure that would allow them and an appearance that would give you the impression that they could go on all day long, okay? Uh, not at a racing speed and not on a tight lead, but just working all day long at a certain task. So while we want beauty and we want nobleness in the appearance, absolutely we want those things, we also want the appearance of a dog who is not clumsy, who is not too heavy or too light to be able to perform the general tasks that most German Shepherds perform. Exactly. And a German Shepherd's supposed to have smooth curves rather than angles, so we want to see a dog with curves, and secondary sex characteristics. So here's something that, unfortunately, our eye can become accustomed to seeing something that's deficient and start to think that it's correct. And especially if you're newer to the breed, you may not realize when you look at the head of a male German Shepherd, that it is not a good representative masculine head. And just because a head is large doesn't make it correct. It must have the proper planes with the, the skull, line of the skull being parallel to the muzzle. Should be enough of a stop. Depth of muzzle, strength of lower jaw, you know, the, eye, the set of the eyes and the shape of the eyes are so important because the dog is supposed to have a look of quality and nobility. You can't get that with round eyes or wide set ears or snipey muzzle. I think we have a lot of work to do when it comes to uh, bringing back really good heads, especially in our males, but also our bitches. You know, uh, you don't want a, a snipey bitch either. So while they do not run on their heads, 
you know, we talk about the essence of a breed. And I don't know, I'm not familiar with a lot of breeds, but I think in German Shepherds, it's a complicated breed to judge because there are three essences in the German Shepherd dog. The first and foremost is the working ability, temperament, character, working ability, the versatility, and all those things that we've all already kind of talked about. The second thing is the look, the look of eagles, the character, quality. You know, they have to have the proper expression or else, you know, I mean, I originally, I know a lot of people were originally attracted to German Shepherds that really looked like German Shepherds just because we loved the look. If we lose that because we have, you know, uh, poor expression, we lose that essence. And then the third is, of course, the movement. If we emphasize any one of those uh, over the other, we start to have problems. Sometimes I think that we have sacrificed everything else for the sake of extreme movement, and I love it as much as anybody, but sometimes I think we've sacrificed everything else at the expense of extreme movement, and yet I don't see a lot of correct movement sometimes. So if we're doing that, let's at least get it correct. So we're gonna go into that a lot more. Again, if anybody has any questions, wants to debate anything, we welcome it. All right, I think we've... All right, so here's a, a basic representative male German Shepherd dog. Pleasing to the eye. You know, when von Stefanitz first developed the breed, the last thing in the world he was concerned about was, was attractive appearance. He was a really, he was just really interested in developing a really sound working and herding style dog. But you know, nowadays we've had the we've had the benefit of, you know, over a hundred years of refinement and improvement. I mean, if you look at the early dogs compared to the dogs today, they look like an entirely different breed. I like our dogs' appearance today a lot better. But you know, we also have to think about our our dogs are a in a sense they are our product that we produce. And, as, and it must remain popular with the general public if we're going to have a successful breed. Would you all agree with that? Okay. And you know as well as I do, if you're walking down the street with a good looking dog, Joe Public notices and they'll say something to you. If you walk down the street with a freaky looking dog, they're going to look at you and then some people if they're actually fairly brave, they're going to ask you what's wrong with the dog, right? So, so you know, we all have, we all have to be con concerned about having a dog that's acceptable and presentable to the public, and a beautiful dog, there's nothing wrong with beauty, there's obviously there's nothing wrong with a beautiful dog, we, you know, we show dogs, part of that is having, having dogs that are attractive and beautiful, as well as functional. And the female is different. Now, I will say, I just want to point some things out as we go along here. I think the croup on this lovely bitch is a little steep. Okay? One of the things that I look at when I see a dog set up or not at full extension is, is this angle here, and we're going to be talking a lot about parallel lines. But this is one of my things. This line here is steeper than this line here. In this position, this dog, these lines should be roughly parallel. This is too steep a croup. Okay, everybody see that? So the reason why I'm pointing that out here is, the reason why I'm pointing that out is, that's an area that I think we really need to be concerned about when we're judging I see an awful lot of steep croups, short steep croups in our breed, and it affects the gait, all right? It has to, because the thigh, the width of the thigh is, is the same as the length of the croup, because these muscles need to attach. So when you see short croups, a lot of times you'll see 
a narrower thigh at the top. You just watch it sometime and you'll, you'll see what I mean. So if you have a longer croup, you'll have a broader thigh, which gives you what? More muscle. German Shepherd dog is a rear drive dog. 70% of the dog's propulsion comes from the hind quarter, 30% from the forehand. So we have to start with a sound, strong hind quarter. And the croup is a really important part of that. If the croup is too steep, it's going to impair the dog's ability to follow through in the rear. If it's too flat, it's going to impair the ability for them to reach underneath them, all right, to begin the propulsion. So the correct angle and length is really important of the crew. Go ahead. With, this, with the lower, le lower thigh. You want to go back? Yes. He was saying, what, what are you comparing this angle to? And I'm comparing it to this part of the leg right here. So this should be flatter, which would make it roughly parallel to this. Go back to the male picture. Yes, that's much closer. Well, we'll talk, ab yeah, we'll talk about the angle of the croup and the pelvis and those things. The croup should be roughly 25 or 23 degrees, somewhere in that range, to be a correctly angled croup. Pelvis is 30, all right? So, but if you start looking at pictures of dogs set up or dogs in the ring, and you take a look at their croup, and then when they're standing like that, see if that line is parallel to their lower thigh. And if it's not, if it's steeper, it's a steep croup. If it's flatter, it's a flat croup. That's an easy way to tell. But it's, it's important because it, it impairs the function of the dog. OK. Go on. Temperament. OK. So I'm of the opinion that if you don't have proper temperament in a German Shepherd dog, you don't really have a German Shepherd dog. It's, it's like the, it's like the non-negotiable thing you have to start with. Um, and I think that there are a considerable number of people who maybe don't really understand what true German Shepherd temperament should be. Um, I think we, we tend to make a lot of excuses for dogs that don't have correct temperament. And the one way we evaluate it in the show ring is called what? Thank you. She said loose lead temperament test. The key is called loose lead. Okay? And it's... Thank you. It's more... What I think we should think of it as, instead of a temperament test, because you know temperament and character are comprised of a, a multiplicity of characteristics. You know, judgment, sound sensitivity, surface sensitivity, all just a whole variety of things. You're not judging that in the ring. What you're judging is, is this dog behaving according to how it's supposed to behave on the loose lead exam? All right, so I get upset when I see judges' critiques where they make representations about a dog's temperament being great or character being great in their write-up. And I'm saying, how would you know? A 10-second loose lead exam and watching them for two and a half minutes in the ring, yeah, the ones that are really bad, you'll see it, all right? because the loose lead exam will uncover them. But we all know there are dogs and there are handlers and there are owners who are really good at training deficient dogs so that they behave for the loose lead exam. Conversely, I've heard people say, well, my bitch is really sound, but she acted up today because she's in season. So what are they saying? They're saying her behavior 
was deficient because she was in season, right? So, you know, they're making my point for me that it, it's a behavior test. It's a very valuable behavior test, but don't jump to broad conclusions. You only can know what a dog's true temperament is if you actually work with them, all right, and ask them to do things. And then you start to get a feel for it. And, and the other thing is, think about it. If we want to improve or we want to, we want to develop certain characteristics in our breed, we breed, we selectively breed for those characteristics generation after generation after generation. I know some breeders are placing that kind of emphasis on temperament, but ask yourself, are all of them? You know, are we breeding generation after generation after generation of dogs based on sound temperament and, and other mental characteristics? Or are, are, all we, are we breeding to the popular winning dog or popular stud dog? And in many cases, not even asking or knowing whether that dog, what kind of temperament that dog has. So if we're not deliberately breeding generation after generation and understanding what good character and temperament is, how can we expect to really get it in a high percentage of our dogs that we breed? Right? Okay. Yes? Is it at all possible, if you're pointing anything out, they can ask the laser pointer on the production? Could you possibly step up to the screen and just point out? You don't want this on there? They can't see the laser. Okay. Do you want to add anything? So, so this is a subject that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I've worked with a lot of dogs in real world situations as well as sports situations. We are so lucky to have a dog that can do almost anything that we want it to do with training. Okay? This was started as a tending dog. A tending dog works at a slow trot, it's responsible for its flock on the grays, and then it morphed from that as industrialization came in um, to more of a working dog. So much so that the German Shepherd now has the moniker of police dog. You'll hear a lot of people say, oh, I like your police dog, okay. Um, but our temperament is built on stable character, biddability, sound nerves, and soundness to environmental stimulus, okay. Further, these dogs have to excel in some kind of a drive, whether it be hunt, prey, food, pack, whatever, okay? I'm sure that Julie will tell you that a dog in tending, herding is a different dog, to be ideal, is a different dog than a street patrol dog, okay? A street patrol dog absolutely may not be suitable for therapy work, okay? Yet we have a breed that can excel in all of these things. And I wanna say, Bob and I talked about this last night and found out we have a, a mutual pet peeve which is judges' critiques that say, this dog had a marvelous temperament. What that dog had on that day was marvelous sociability. He showed that he wanted to be your buddy, that he was happy to have you pet him. He did not show you that he could do any one of the many jobs that German Shepherd dogs can do and do very, very well. So as breeders, this is more as breeders than judges, because judges don't have the opportunity to say, oh, you know, what kind of titles does your dog have? We can't say that. We don't get to know that, okay? That's not something we're allowed to know. So, all we can do is evaluate what we see in the ring. But you as breeders and students of the breed, it's imperative that you find a way to work these dogs, to test these dogs, to see what kind of nerves they have okay to see what kind of ability they have and as Bob said it's absolutely true that you don't know until you put the screws to the metal and find out okay and if you've got a dog um, that can only perform let's say close to you and on leash you need to know that okay a tending dog a schutzen dog a search and rescue dog they have to go out there and perform a task without the support of you right by their side telling them every step of the way what to do it's important that these dogs be able to do that and so we got to get on with the standard i know that but i really beg you to pay attention to that see if a dog comes up to you and seems to own the ground it stands on i saw several dogs today that were absolutely confident I'm sure the judges are here. They saw a few dogs today. They 
were not as happy with their confidence level, okay? That's unacceptable. We can't allow that, and it shouldn't be allowed. All right, so we've done a little bit of preaching at this point and expanding quite a bit, but it's only because we just want to emphasize that for our breed to be exceptional, it starts with great temperament. Now, how does this apply to you when you're judging dogs in the ring and you have two and a half minutes and you're going to do a loose lead exam? Well, we're going to show you a correct loose lead exam when we get to the hands-on portion. But let me just share a couple of things with you. You know, handlers are paid to win with your dogs. So they're going to employ techniques in order to pass the loose lead exam. The, the most important is put your hand down and touch them and if they stand there with confidence then that's all you need to do you don't need to love them up and hug them and kiss them and all that stuff right it's all you need to do you walk away I witnessed today with our judges excellent procedure when it came to the loose lead exam and I want to compliment them for that because I don't see it very often when I'm witnessing judging so we really need to do that and um, if we're going to do it let's do it right okay any questions and fall in love with uh, every stranger they meet but at the same time they should be interested in people they should accept approaches and they should be have steady nerves under almost any circumstances. Okay. All right, size. Has anybody seen a 24 inch dog winning in the show ring lately? Raise your hand if you have. But it doesn't say anything outside of that range is a fault. It says it's desirable. It doesn't say that a 26 inch dog is more desirable than a 24 inch dog, but I guarantee you, if you had a 24 inch dog, it, you know, people would think it was ridiculously small when it's actually correct according to standard. Right? This is a medium sized dog. Many, many of the dogs and bitches we have today are oversized. But again, how would you know? Because when do we measure them? You never see them measured in the ring. We don't have, have the ability to do that. How many people have measured their dogs outside of the ring, at home or whatever, and done it properly? Good, okay? You know, one of my favorite things is, is people who think, you know, there are judges who penalize dogs for being too large, too small, bitches too large, too small, things. But I say, how would you really know how big they are? Because over time, your eye can become distorted. Well, I've got a place on my trousers. Well, are your heels of your shoes all the same height? You know, I mean, it's just, 
if we really think it's important, if we really think, and I think size is important, but if we really think size is important, why don't we develop some kind of outside the ring measuring program? So we can know precisely whether we're in the standard or outside of the standard. That's just my opinion, but I think it'd be a great idea. No, the proportions. Proportions, eight and a half to Yeah, it's, so it's the reason why we don't measure in the ring. We write these numbers yet we don't measure. So I just wondered why. Yeah, because we don't. They're not measured in the ring because it's not included in the standard to do that. All right, but there's nothing preventing us from having a program. You know, there's nothing in the standard about having OFA hips, but we have OF, a serious OFA program, right? And we all advertise. We got OFA good hips or excellent or elbows and all that kind of thing. So why can't we have a, like a registry where we're measuring properly, like when we have temperament certification, like we had here today, maybe we could have a measurement certification. Does anybody think that might be a good idea? Anybody think maybe it's a waste of time? Don't care? I mean, you could say that and, and have a le legitimate argument because the standard doesn't say it's fault. Doesn't say what to do. Pardon me? Then why do it? Yeah. So if you think it's important, then maybe you'd want to support it. If you don't, then you wouldn't. That as a breeder, the reason to do that, to have that type of certification, not that it would disallow any dogs or allow other dogs, but as breeders so that we know we're staying within a standard, that we're not going too big and we're not going too small because that would show trends where we're going. Did everybody hear that? As a breeder, it would be valuable information to have to know whether we're falling within the parameters in the standard or starting to evolve into much bigger dogs or you know, whatever the case may be. I personally like the idea. I think it would be a valuable thing to do. And it would be purely voluntary. If you don't, you know, if you don't want to participate in it, you don't want to have your dog measured, let's say you measure him at home first and he's 29 inches, don't laugh. Uh, you know, maybe you wouldn't want to do it. Just as, just as an aside to that, almost every place else in the world does have a program like this. It's called the Breed Survey. Okay, and it's, it's done almost everywhere else in the world. Uh, they tried it here in the United States about 50 years ago, and we were kind of an independent lot, and we didn't, we didn't take to it too well. But I think Bob's idea of some kind of a voluntary thing that you could do would be excellent, just so you know, just so you have information, so you're not speculating. How many of you measure your own dogs at home? Excellent. AKC actually already has this program. It's the agility height measurement. You do not have to compete in agility to get a height um, card. So right now, you can get a card that has your dog's measurement on it with the agility height. So you never have to do agility. You just have to show up at an agility trial with your um, AKC number, and they'll give you a true shoulder height. That's great information. Everybody hear that? OK, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's awesome. All right, and then proportions, eight and a half to 10. And that, that length of 10 measured from the prosternum to the rear end of the pelvis, right? Or the tubial ischiosophy. That's easy for me to say. OK. Anyway, the, there are three parts to that length, the wither, the back, and the croup. All right? So, and the back includes the loin. What we're seeing today is a lot of too much length in the loin. The length should come from, most of the length should come from this section here and this section back here. And the back should be relatively short and the loin should be relatively short. If we're having too long a loin, we're, there's, there's a weakness, all right? 
So watch out for that. There tends to be, you know, keep your proportions in mind. There tends to be, uh, uh, you know, a certain percentage of dogs we're seeing too, length, too much length of loin. Now body, so body depth. So different standards, like the European standard is different than, well, the European standard defines what they want. Ours does not. So when we talk about 45-55 or 50-50 or 55-45, remember there's nothing in the standard that states those percentages. Those are kind of judgments that we make about what we think is correct for our dogs. And, you know, generally though, the acceptable range, I think that most people would agree with, and like I said, there's some disagreement among people, and it's, it's valid, but, but it's acceptable, is 50-50 between length of leg and depth of body, or a few extra degrees either way, up to five. Probably uh, leaning more toward 45 body and 55 leg or 50-50. But remember, to know exactly what we're talking about, you have to take into account that it's the sternum that's supposed to be at the elbow and doesn't matter, you still have other things surrounding the sternum that are going to make it look deeper, okay? The head. All right, the head. Um, geez. You know, the German Shepherd head, correct head, is so important. Shape and angle of eyes, almond shape eyes at a slight slant. The angle, the parallel lines with the muzzle and the skull. The width of the back skull. So you can get a one impression by looking at the profile of a dog's head and a different impression if you go around to the front and you look at them from the front. And we have a lot of dogs that when you look at them from the front, they don't have anywhere near enough skull, width of skull. Okay, have you, are you seeing that? Have you agree with that? So it's important that we look at them from the front and not just the side. You know, refinement has a way of reproducing itself. And so we have to constantly be aware of that. We need dogs with good, correct heads. And that's a really nice head in profile, a male head. Female head. Length of muzzle should not be longer than that. And then from the front, you can see the width of the skull. I've seen so many dogs lately that look like the muzzle is about the same width as the skull. And there's a nice female head. So the, the size of the head, the planes, and the expression are all super important. Because remember, that's one of the essences of our breed, is this look of eagles, this, this look of nobility. The teeth, 42 teeth, right? It's pretty standard, um, you know, 20 upper, 22 lower. I haven't been seeing a lot of missing teeth lately. What is your experience? Thanks for asking. I haven't <laughs> seen a lot of missing teeth either, but you know what? I am seeing a tremendous number of them, maybe you are too, is even bites. Even bites, even in young dogs. And I think that's a little disturbing because an even bite, particularly in a young dog, will probably end up with a dog who has no, no incisor bite at all by the time they're older. But I, and I'm seeing a lot of that. Okay. Anybody have any other, any observations about teeth? Are you? 
Not, not, I, I have not, fortunately, but, yeah. Okay. The show, um, did a show, we worked judged on the same weekend and we both commented how many level bites we saw that weekend. So everybody understand the different types of bites and there's only one correct and that's the scissors bite, right? All right, neck, top line, and body. So backs, the back should be straight, ideally straight, all right? No roach, no sag, straight, strong and straight. You can have, you know, there's certain school people think you can't have a strong back unless it's a arched back or a roach back. I just don't think that's true because I've seen dogs that have a perfectly straight back and it's iron, okay? So that's what we want to see. That's our goal. I'm seeing a real lack of good backs today. And you want a back that doesn't bob, wiggle, shake, roll. You want a back that's like glass when the dog is moving, okay? Little to no movement. Um, The croup we, we've talked about, so you can see there's the angles of the croup, all right? The pelvis is 30 degrees, but the croup is 20, does that say 23 or 25? 23. Yeah, so, you know, in that range there is a good croup. It's the right angle. And by the way, See what I mean? Okay. Tails. Oh. You don't want to get me started on tails. What has happened to tails in our breed? The tail is an extension of the spine. Tail is supposed to be under the full control of the dog. It should be strong. It should, the dog should be able to control the tail and not have the tail whip, bob, bounce off the hocks as it's moving, hang, limp, none of those things. I'm seeing a fairly significant percentage of our dogs that have weak or dead tails. Now, I don't know what's causing it, but it can't be good. First of all, it's visually offensive to me, and I see them right away. And secondly, it's like I said, it's extension of the spine, so it can't be good. I find that most, well, I have to be careful what I say here, but too many judges are rewarding dogs with dead tails. For me, it's a non-starter. It's a deal killer. Unfortunately, they've become so prevalent, there are times you can't help but place a dog with a dead tail. But I hate having to do it, and I won't give them the top awards. So I would encourage you, judge, when you're judging, to pay attention to tails, please, because I think it's become a serious problem. where a tail curls up or a tail curls over to the yeah. side. Does that bother so you? The question, that yeah, the question about curly tails, they don't bother me nearly as much. A tail is allowed to have a bit of a, of a curl to it or a twist to it. That's, that's really not a big deal, but a dead tail is, in my opinion. The standard says on that curly tail only to the extent to which it mars the general appearance. Right. It's, not a, it's not as serious a fault. It, it, can, it can distort mm -hmm. the overall picture, I agree. And, and it says it should not mar the general appearance. One thing I wanted to mention, in addition to tails, is the, <clears throat> there was, well, it's gone now, but the, this frame that referred to the underline of the dog should not be paunchy, should be tucked up and held firmly. 
And I've seen way, way too many dogs who are too long in loin and the underline is tubular. They look um, rectangular in appearance. And, and to me, that looks weak. That doesn't look like a dog that's firmly held. That doesn't look like a nimble athlete. I don't like that paunchy look underneath, and I don't think the standard does either, more importantly. So I think that's something we also need to pay attention to. Uh, and the tail thing, I, I see them, I saw several today. It was, it's shocking, actually, how many you're seeing these days. Okay. Four quarters. So the first sentence in the standard says, the shoulder blades are long and obliquely angled laid on flat and not placed forward. So I'm making a big deal out of that. So correct placement puts the top of the shoulder blade somewhere in this vicinity. And if you have proper return of upper arm, you're going to have a shoulder assembly that looks like this. I have seen shoulder blades starting to the whole assembly drifting forward to when you're looking at the dog standing, it's like this is like under the ears. Now, it can't be good. First of all, the standard says not placed too far forward. But secondly, why can't it be good? It's very deceptive sometimes because the further forward things are, the more it looks like they reach. But if you put the forelegs, the front legs, and the shoulder assembly too far forward, they're too far forward of the dog's center of gravity. We don't have a slide for that, do we? Dog's center of gravity, when it's standing, is right behind the wither. As it moves and speeds up, the center of gravity moves forward. So it needs to have the support over the center, under the center of gravity. Which feet are bigger on a dog, front feet or back feet? Front feet. Right? And there's a reason for that. They're significantly bigger because they're more weight bearing. This shoulder assembly and the forelegs need to be closer to the center of gravity on the dog. And uh, we're seeing a lot of ones that are just too far forward, either because the whole assembly is too far forward or because the shoulder's straight or the upper arm's straight or they're both straight. Okay? Everybody with me on that? Have you been noticing that? No? Pay attention to it, please, okay? Because I see it as an area that really needs to be addressed. So, the pastors. Uh, I said earlier, I remember a time when we had a lot of pastern problems. Has anybody here ever had a puppy went down on its pastern so flat and it never came up? Is that one of the most heartbreaking, painful things to look at and to think about. And they don't have to be that bad, but I'm seeing, I'm starting to see, I think, more weak pasterns than we should have. And I, and I disagree, you know, people who say, well, you know, puppy, puppies can have weak pasterns. Well, they can, and they can get stronger as they mature, but they don't have to have weak, puppies don't have to have weak pasterns just because they're puppies, right? They can have good, strong pasterns. A lot of it has to do with the length of the pastern, which corresponds to the length of the hock. Now, the standard says approximately 25 degrees for the pastern. And actually, I think 25 degrees is, should be maximum. All right? I wouldn't even mind a 24 or 23 degree pastern. Now, you don't want it any straighter than that. But 25 is really maximum. And so I think we really need to look at pasterns when you're judging and see, do we have weak pasterns? Do we have long pasterns and long hawks? Something I'd like to say about that has to do with the feet. Um, I have actually penalized and not used some otherwise lovely animals because they had really, really bad feet. And anyone that works a dog for any period of time will tell you that feet are critical, okay? I, um, 
Bob has worked dogs too. He understands this concept. I went down and worked Katrina a long, long time ago and put dogs on the rubble pile. And dogs with poor feet were coming off of that rubble pile, bloodied and cut and hurt. And dogs with the really good firm pads, they did just fine. So that's something as a breeder, as a judge, don't, don't just overlook it and say, well, boy, they can really go and they can really move and they've got beautiful type. Those feet are critical to a dog's working ability. If you don't have a foot, they say no foot, no horse. Well, it's kind of true in dogs, too. All right, next. All right, so again, the shoulders should be laid on flat, not what's called loaded. So you want to have when the dog pulls up in front of you and the handler, before the handler gets a chance to reach down and straighten the front legs, you'd really like to see that dog naturally put them down straight, parallel in front, feet pointing straight forward, right? Dogs that can do that, that's good. Parallel planes, hindquarters. So once again, we see the words broad, broad as it relates to the thigh. Broad is more muscle, more strength, more power. It's a rear drive dog. You want a dog that can power off of the hindquarter. So there's propulsion from the hindquarter, then there's transmission through the middle piece, extension from the forehand, and then if it all works together, suspension. So think of those four words, but it starts with propulsion from the hindquarter. So you need a good, strong hindquarter. And one of the things that you need is a short, strong hock. Long hocks don't function as well. Long hocks equate to longer pasterns, so there's a weakness there. The hock on the underreach should not have the heel of the hock flat on the ground. Only the toe pad on the underreach of the hindquarter should be touching the ground. Okay? And then on the follow through, I think we have some illustrations of that then. Here's, here are two common faults as you're standing, watching them from behind, and there's a correct, correct rear. Okay. Coat. Pardon me? Yeah, right. So coat, you know, um, who doesn't love a beautiful coat on a dog, right? The best show dogs, especially a lot of the dogs have been really successful as best in show dogs, it's because they have beautiful coats. And you know how great it feels when you run your hand down a, a dog with a beautiful coat, the coarse outer coat, you know, it's, it's so smooth and, and glassy almost, and they have this thick undercoat. Well, there's a good reason for it from a functional standpoint, but it's also beautiful. Problem is, I've been doing this for 50 years, Problem is, for years, the first question that a bitch owner would ask of a stud dog is, does he carry coat? And no, we don't want to breed to a dog that carries coat. So we're breeding bitches that don't carry the coat factor to dogs that don't carry the coat factor, generation after generation after generation to the point where we've virtually eliminated a lot of nice plush coats. Now, actually, I see them coming back, so I think it's become more important to people, but um, I personally don't ever breed away from dogs that carry a coat factor, because I, I don't mind having a few coats in a litter, long coats in a the litter. They make great pets, people love them, we can show them. Um, there's classes specifically for them. We just can't trim them, that's, that's a disqualification, don't trim them. But um, it's a minor fault. And uh, a lot of times it seems like the best puppy in the litter is the long coat, you know? But the point is, if we, wanna, if we want to have really nice, correct, beautiful, plush coats on our dogs, we can't be avoiding dogs, breeding to dogs that carry the coat factor, okay? There's six variations of color. And when you judge, you should be colorblind. Not any one of these is superior to the other when you're judging. Might be a whole different story for your breeding program, you have a preference. But when you're judging, you can't let any one of these 
uh, have an advantage over another. Now, it, standard does say they want it, you know, strong, rich colors and pigments. So we want to make sure that we're not, you know, watch out for the faded ones, but basically a uh, bicolor is just as acceptable as a saddle dog, as a sable, and, uh, and just kind of ignore that part of it when you're judging, right? Okay, everybody, st everybody still with me? We're awake? Okay. Gait. So this seems to be the thing that we focus the most on nowadays and when we're judging. And there's no question about it, it's supremely important because this was originally a herding dog and it needed to be able to trot effortlessly all day and have the endurance that it would derive from being correct functionally. But I just want to emphasize that what we're seeing in the ring in many cases is not correct. And we need to be really understanding what correct is and rewarding correct. Otherwise, we start going in directions that I'm seeing that are make it very difficult when you're judging. Uh, it becomes a lot of work uh, with some of the, particularly like rears that I'm seeing today or forehands as well. So we need to understand correct. So it's a single track dog. It's tracking toward the center line going and coming. Supposed to give the appearance of being effortless, ground covering, but balance is the most important thing. Also, at a trot, it's typical for the one hind foot to pass outside on the underreach of the corresponding front leg and the other one on the inside. Transmission. The only way you can have really good transmission is a correct hind quarter and a strong back and middle piece and correct length. Wait a minute. Back up. Please. Um, dogs that are running downhill where the wither is lower than the croup when they're trotting, they're fighting gravity. All right, why do we want dogs that are going uphill? Because of the force of gravity as the dog is being driven forward brings the dog down. So if you start out too level or with a lower wither, the dog is putting too much stress on the forehand, the shoulder assembly, and it's going to break down faster. So we need, now we don't need steep top lines, but we do definitely need an uphill line of transmission, I call it, okay? The line of transmission should be a angle that is moderately uphill. Yeah, anytime you want, just jump in. I'd like to say something about gate two. If I could strike any statement from the standard, <clears throat> it would be covering the maximum amount of ground with the minimum number of steps. That does not mean <laughs> that the fastest dog or the flying, flying dog or a dog that takes one step less than the next dog is necessarily the best dog because we have to look at the entire picture, the breed type, um, the soundness of the dog, the character of the dog, the way they stand on the ground they walk on. What Bob touched on is so important to have harmony, effortlessness, and smooth movement. Some of the gait we see in the ring, the handlers are moving the dogs so fast that a multitude of sins is covered up. In my opinion, you cannot judge a tending, herding dog at breakneck speed as fast as they can go. They need to go slow. You need to be able to see the footfall. You do not need to race these dogs around and try to see who's taking the fewest number of steps. And on that note, is Kent Boyles here? Kent's not here. Kent did an experiment so many, many years ago. I don't even know if he remembers this, because we got in a big 
intellectual discussion about this. And he set out some cones, and he took a Grand Victrix, who was widely believed to be one of the finer moving German Shepherd dogs in our breed, and he ran her down and back with a golf cart between those stanchions many, many times and counted the steps. And then he took a dog that was a working line German Shepherd dog that would, most fanciers would consider to be a pretty average mover at best <clears throat> and counted those steps. And the difference in the number of steps was astonishingly small. The reason was the Grand Victrix, and I'm not, <laughs> she's a beautiful bitch, don't get me wrong, but she pointed here and sat down here, okay? So at the end of the day, okay, there was not really an appreciable difference. The idea is to find harmony, balance, smooth ground covering, efficient gait that's sound at both ends, where you don't have to make excuses for hindquarters that are twisting, tails that look like rudders on fire, and fronts that are flipping up in the air. That is not proper movement. It's just not. Good points. And we're going to go into a little more detail on that in, in the next few slides. Okay, you can go. All right, so this now, given the dog we're looking at in these pictures, we deliberately, or it was deliberately designed, it's a moderate dog, but actually it's a very correct dog, and it's preferable to some of the more extreme dogs we see today. It'll give you more strength and endurance. So, some of the things to look for, and these are really important, because remember, it's a rear drive dog, and we're seeing problems with this today. So the first thing, and one of the easiest things to see is, is this joint opening and the foot flexing backwards at a, at a, at a moderate angle, uh, or is it stopping the backstroke with a vertical hock? If it's got a vertical hock, it's cutting its stroke short. And you can notice it if you watch the dog will be stroke it back and it'll be like it hits an abrupt stop before it brings it forward because it's not following through. So it's not getting maximum benefit off, the, off of the rear extension. The other thing is, and, I, and I'm finding a lot of people never notice this, this joint here has to open. And I see a lot of dogs where it doesn't. This is staying relatively closed, which then causes this to kick up. So you're losing a lot of propulsion there. The stifle or the knee joint staying closed and not opening can be a result of a steep croup or too long of upper and lower thigh bones. There's a kind of a picture of one that's now sometimes during the course of the, you know, the gait, that joint is going to be more closed but at full extension, it should be open. All right, stop there. All right, so let's take a look at this. So the shoulder blade so the shoulder joint here is open, as it should be, all right? The elbow joint is open, as it should be. And how, what does that result in? Good front extension with the foot close to the ground. If it doesn't, this is what you end up with. A lot of wasted motion. We see that, I call it flailing, lifting, it's wasted motion, it's incorrect, it looks flashy, a lot of times there'll be a lot of applause, but um, if you see an animal, what, what you should always do is look to see if the, uh, if the upper arm 
at full extension, is it vertical or is it open? If it's vertical, they're reaching, some people call it reaching from the elbow, some people don't like that term, but basically what it means is they're not opening their shoulder and they're not, and so the upper arm is staying vertical and so they can't reach properly. So I think the dead giveaway on that is when you look and you look at pictures on Facebook or in, used to be to review or whatever, you see, you know, like this, and the upper arm is straight up and down, that is a incorrect. That's incorrect for that dog. This one's kicking up in the rear, not enough underreach, poor underdrive, probably because of a flat croup. Many times a flat croup comes with a high tail set. So that should be a smooth, perfectly smooth line from the back, loin, croup, tail set, down to the tip of the tail. This one also has a soft back. This one's got a lot of problems. All right. Here's the disqualifications. So I want to point something out here. This puppy, this puppy's a really nice puppy. Look at the bone. The short pasterns and hocks. Look at where, if you draw a line, a vertical line up from the elbow, it's right at the center of gravity of the dog, right underneath the wither. Looks like it's got a nice prosternum, forechest, good shoulder layback, and nice return of upper arm. That's a very good puppy. That should be a picture you have in your mind when you're looking at dogs set up in the ring before they start to move. Correct show pose. You know, some people have a habit of really overstretching their dogs. You can't really see good structure that way. Um, I, I, I don't know why they do it. You know, you set them up so the hawk is, just go back. So the hawk is vertical or close to vertical and the toe of the inside foot should be under the curve of the stifle and the front legs should be vertical. That's a dog that's stretched too far on the left hind leg and the right hind leg is tucked under too far. It's very uncomfortable for most dogs. They don't look their best that way. And it's also the front legs are set back too far in this pose. So again, we want to emphasize as we come to the back of this beautiful publication, all of the different venues where the German Shepherd dog excels and serves mankind. And it really is a remarkable dog. Our goal should be to do everything we can to improve on our breed, to breed correct dogs, to judge the dogs and reward dogs that are correctly structured, sound dogs, and there's nothing wrong with beautiful dogs. So um, do you have any further comments you'd like to make? Anybody have? It's just that we have probably the most versatile breed on the planet. Let's not let them down, okay? Let's rise to them. Yeah, okay. So are, are we going to go over yeah. now immediately? Now we, now we go over to the ring again. The applicants and we'll the follow us over there. So the, so the yeah, anybody, any questions, comments? In the follow through, you've asked I, enough questions. No, go ahead. Am I okay? I've over asked. Okay, in the follow through, I've noticed some pictures where the hawk is like kicking in or doing something. It's not only just curling up, but not the hawk, but the hind foot is kind of going in in an extreme mover. Is that you, you mean correct? it's pointing in toward the center line? Yeah, the toe, yeah, the toe's not going straight back. It's, I'm seeing it, I've seen pictures in. It's on Facebook of that it's recently. Probably, it's probably not tracking, it's probably not tracking toward a center line the way it should. 
So that would mean it's twisting its hocks. I, I would agree. It's probably coming from the hock and the and the knee joint, not not from the foot. questions can you just talk about uh, DQs for blues and livers based on nose color not predominantly black I didn't understand a word he said blues and livers are not listed as disqualifying faults however a nose that is not predominantly black is and blues and livers do not have black noses. So by, uh, by um, supposition, we have to assume that blues and livers, and, and quite, by the way, I've seen blues and livers never in the ring, never in the ring. Have you seen a blue or a liver in the ring? Linda? No. John? Any other judge seen a blue or a liver? Never. It's not so, I do think Lang Scarta finished one many, many years ago. Uh, where's Sherry? Hubens Gray Boy or Blue Boy? but uh, you just don't see it. 